good friend of the Metropolitan section. He's a homegrown golf fanatic whose love for the game comes through our TVs on broadcast of NBC each week. He went to nearby White Plains High School, same as Player of the Year Frank Benzel. He's a longtime member of the Westchester Crunch Club and he takes lessons from Harvey Lanning. Uh, he's been with NBC for many years and with ESPN before that. He's piled up 13 Emmy Awards for broadcasting and he's worked with the legend Howard Cosell as a writer and a producer back at ABC. He's worked at 10 Olympic Games, Wimbledon Championships, and many, many other sporting events. And he's received critical acclaim for his Olympic moments and his news and notes from the PGA Tour. And in 2009, he published his first book, Breaking the Slump, detailing the struggles of many famous golfers and how they found their way out and back on top. And he presented those ideas here at our section some years ago. Brad Faxon, Brad's one of golf's great ambassadors. A winner on both the PGA and the Champions Tour and a member of the PGA Tour's policy board. He was an All-American at the Furman University and played on the Walker Cup team. He's won eight PGA Tour events and a Champions Tour event last year and he's played on two Ryder Cup teams. He and his friend Billy Andre started a charity for children that has raised over $15 million in the Northeast area. He's received many awards including the Haskins Award for the Most Outstanding College Golfer and the Charlie Bartlett Award, and this past week he received the Jimmy, Jim Murray Award at Augusta National by the Golf Writers Association. And he has played on many of our golf courses throughout the Metropolitan section. Uh, thanks to our friends at Titleist, we'd like to show a little video that we've helped put together as an introduction. The PGA Metropolitan section welcomes Brad Faxon and Jimmy Roberts to the 50th Annual Educational Forum, presented by Titleist. On behalf of all my peers at Titleist, we are honored to be involved in the Met Section Education Forum. It is key executives at Titleist, like Joe Curtis and Peter Broom, who understand that we have to provide not only best-in-class products and services, but also support best-in-class education programs like this. We have a vested interest in showcasing you to your members as the expert in your field. If you are succeeding by growing the game, then we succeed. All of us at Titleist are thrilled that Brad is here. Brad has been one of the most respected players in the game for his entire career, and we are excited at what he has to share with the Met section. Thank you. My name is Brad Faxon, and I'm from Barrington, Rhode Island. My earliest memories are going out to the course early in the morning, you know, with my dad, I'll never forget being out on a golf course near the water, you know, with the fresh air and the wind. something that I could really do and do well. It wasn't something all my friends liked to play. Baseball was cool, hockey was cool. Golf wasn't cool then. But I enjoyed going out there and there's nothing I really hate about golf. But winning's why all of us play. We always want to be you know, in the last group on Sunday with a chance to win. That adrenaline rush, the thrill you get from hitting a good shot down the stretch with lots of people watching. He got it nice and clean. What he did, and look at my shot. Is it? Oh, what? Wow! That's why I play golf. My favorite shot to hit has to be a, a tough, short putt with some break. Oh, yes. That goes in. His biggest payday ever. Brad Faxon is the champion. The best one I ever had was the Sony Open in Hawaii in 2001. Four Eagles, 20 under par. And this has to go down in 2001 as one of the best. It was the best golf I've ever played. The greatest moment on the course for me was in 1995 on the 18th green at Riviera. This for par for 63 and probably a spot on the Ryder Cup team. And yes! I made about a 12 foot putt to make the Ryder Cup team. It would be great to recapture that feeling every morning when I wake up. During the past 23 years, in over 600 professional starts on the USPGA Tour, 
Brad Faction has had eight wins and is recognized as one of the greatest putters in the history of the game. But much as Brad has been a winner on the course, he has been as much a winner and a giver off the course. My kids, I'm so lucky and blessed. It's neat being a parent of girls, and it's, it's really nice to have kids that are great kids who are involved in you know, a lot of community things. And if we can help kids or help people in need, then what a bonus. The Payne Stewart Award is created to recognize an individual each year who reflects the special qualities Payne embodied. And uh, nobody, Brad, represents what's important to that image than you do. Congratulations. Everyone asks me what I'd do if I didn't play golf, and I always look at them quizzically and say, it's all I've ever wanted to do. And uh, it's what I want to do still. If you have to believe in yourself as much as you can, I love to play golf. It's my passion, you know, it is my job, but it's my life. Everything that I've learned in my life, I, I, can, I can pay, pay back to the game of golf, and uh, pay back to the people I met as a kid, the people I met traveling all over the world. And, uh, there's no way that I, I would ever want a life without God.
15 from the back team. So, um, he had 813. 813, it's amazing. But you know, that shot on 10, you know, I said on the radio yesterday, for a lefty, that was an easier shot for a right. We, we all know it's easier to, to hook a higher lofted club than it is a, to a lower lofted club. And you know, he had the, the luxury of the ball being a little bit above his feet, you know, to help his hook. He had a downhill eye so he could turn down the pitching wedge a little bit to hit it further. And you saw when the ball landed, it actually had so much spin, um, left to right spin, hook spin for him that it curved it up the hill on a steeply pitched screen. Amazing shot to do it. I heard, I heard Harvey say before the break, talking about uh, observations on Tiger, and, you know, had, had listened to what Curtis Strange had to say, and the whole idea of playing, playing your swing instead of playing golf. Do you think that's one of the things about him is that he doesn't, he's just playing golf. You know, he's not that. playing his swing yet. Absolutely. And, you know, he thrives on a ball that he doesn't have to hit straight. I don't think you ever stand behind a club and, and watch a ball start down the target line and stay there. It's always got some sort of curve. And I think, you know, Jack Nicholas said, and players have said, and great players have said, that forever the hardest shot to hit is a straight ball. Um, it is for me. Yeah. And how many times you hit a ball in the woods and you have to curve it around and straight, and all of a sudden you forget about, well, where's this club need to be at the top of my swing? And you can hit a, hit a great shot. Uh -huh. You know, I, I don't know what the big deal about that shot was. I, as I said to a friend of mine the other day, you know, I've hit a 40-yard left to right shot. I do that all the time. Uh, <laughs> Your car is moving to left. That's right. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about, about something else that's been in the news lately. You know, uh, before we leave the Masters, I, I just, one of the observations I have that's, yeah. a, that's amazing what, what this tournament does, what the pressure does, and how it affects the top players in the world. You know, when Phil Mickelson hit his tee shot on the fourth ball and hits the grandstand and goes into the bamboo over there, when's the last time you've seen, you seen Phil really make a couple of bad decisions like that? I thought it looked like Tom Brady in, in the Super Bowl in the end zone when he threw that pass to us, you know, where he got a safety that didn't have the best. Where even he was out of sorts. You know, he, he didn't think it through. He didn't have the conversations with the guy that he normally does. And, and all of a sudden, he's scraping these shots out of there. We don't know what would have happened if he went back to the team. He, he could have made it five, he could have made another six. But it just it goes to show you, you have the top players in the world. Um, Peter Hansen hit a shank off a tee shot on the 12th hole. You never see that. Kucher after Eagle in the 15th hole. Misses the green to the right with an eight or nine. I don't know what club he did on 16, but. Tiger shank went on 16. Tiger did the same thing. Um, and, and then the two drives that both, both the leaders hit, Oost Hazen and Bubba on 17, and they both get big slices. Um, and it's just amazing what the, the pressure of the Masters can do. Let, let's stay there just again for, for one minute then uh, and talk about that fourth ball because as much as Bubba's shot to win the, uh, to win the Masters is going to be talked about, I think a lot of people will probably remember what happened to Mickelson on the fourth ball. I was amazed to hear him afterwards say that that was where he was aiming. Is that, is that possible? Well, I mean, not the grandstand. He said he got a bad break because it hit the, because it actually hit the iron and bounced up. And now, I know he didn't want to be right of the hole, but is that possible? He, well, he was probably aiming at the left edge. He could be aiming at the center of that bunker and trying to, for him to draw it into the left side of the green there because right is dead, right is a bogey. And, you know, Phil can get it up and down from a lot of places. And that left bunker is an easier shot than anywhere else to miss the green. Um, but I don't, I don't buy it. That ball is cutting. If, if it's you, do you go back to the tee? Um, you know, it's easy to say that I've never been in that position where, you know, you're right there with, ah, I actually have, but um, <laughs> I've thrown it over myself a <laughs> lot. Um, but it didn't look like you could move that ball at all. And then the you know, shot that you were going to have left in there was going to be off an awful lot of the restricted backs when he said that to, to Bones and then he had carrying a bunker uh, and then the shot he ended up having for his fourth shot was up dirt and fertile and then he ended up in the bunker. Awesome. All right, let's move on and talk about something that something else that's been in the news lately that I would imagine a lot of folks in this room are interested in and that's the, the book that Hank Haney and Jaime Diaz wrote about Tiger Woods and the time that Hank spent as Jaime's instructor. Inbounds, outbounds, what do you think? Totally outbounds for uh, any uh, teacher to do this. And, and I don't think it's just because of you know, you're, you're, you're 
you, know, you have a little path maybe that you have with your, your relationship with your, your student. But I mean, I, I don't know if everybody's read this book. I'm three quarters of the way through it right now. But I mean, he's saying some stuff about other teachers about, you know, it's inside the ropes really that I don't, I don't know if it should be allowed. When we were at the, uh, the sports writer dinner on Wednesday night, Yanni Singh was awarded the LPGA Player of the Year. And uh, her teacher was sitting at the same table. And uh, Gilchrist said, yeah. Yeah. And he, she said, I hope you don't write a book about me in five years. It was very funny. Well, but uh, I, I, you know, there's no question that Tiger's been the best golfer over the last 15 years of anybody that's ever played. And he's been the most private golfer until 2008. So everybody wants to know, yeah, what is inside this guy's brain? And I think Haney's position, and you know him better, you talk to him, was look, I can ex explain to you and show you what drives this guy, what makes him think, what makes his brain tick when it comes to the golf game, and how his you know, strong as work ethic is. But, you know, you, you talk to Hank, I mean, I'd, be, I'd love to know what Hank's position is. Um. Why he wrote the book? Why does not think it's a breach of trust? Well, what he said to me, we did something with him on the Golf Channel, it was about two weeks ago, what he said to me was that, you know, other coaches have written books, guys that, you know, may well go down as the, the greatest golfer of all time. He's incredibly secretive, and he thought that this would be something that people would really want to know about. And, you know, if I'm not mistaken, it got the number one on the New York Times bestseller list this past week. There's an enormous amount of interest. I think personally that it's been made a lot worse by the fact that Tiger is so secretive about everything. You know, and everything is an issue. Um, there have, as Hank said, there have been other teachers who have written books. Um, you know, Joe Torre wrote a book about the Yankees and had some things to say that were pretty revealing. I would imagine that Joe Torre is still pretty well from Yankee Stadium by, by all the fans. And, How about in the clubhouse? Well, you're a Red Sox fan, that doesn't count, I can't answer that. Um, yeah, it's interesting, I think that the, the, it was a pretty combustible situation, what with Tiger's uh, propensity to not want to share anything, right. and uh, you know, the whole issue of violating the teacher and student relationship. There have been other teachers who've written books, though. No, you're right. Yeah, you know, I always thought it was interesting as a player out there playing alongside Tiger. Um, what, what he would do, you know, he, he played all his practice rounds at 6.30 in the morning, seven o'clock, he was off the course of many times at 10, 10, 30, 11, and he, he didn't spend a lot of time on the range at a tour event, pounding balls all the time. I mean, occasionally he'd be there with whether it was Bush or Hank. But, you know, from when he left the golf course at 12, to the next tee time, say in the middle of 12 o'clock the next day, that's a lot of time, you know? Now maybe he knew what he was doing, but that would have been, no. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so let's talk about long putters. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, we roll right into our discussion on long putters. Uh, so the USGA and uh, the RNA apparently considering, or at least the United States Golf Association is, uh, perhaps taking some action on long putters. You, uh, well, what's your feeling on that? It's, it's such a hot topic now, and if, you know. I graduated from the PGA Tour, the Champions Tour, again last year. And I think if you ask the PGA Tour players, you know, what's your opinion? Should we keep it and uh, or modify it? Most of them say, let's get rid of it. On the Senior Tour, it's like, let's let's keep it out there. You know? and, um, so it, it depends on your viewpoint for sure. But I'm, I'm of the belief that you shouldn't be able to use something that anchors against your body and, and that could aid you in helping in the putt. And, and all of us, when we, you know, when we've had lessons, given lessons, uh, one of the first things I re ever remember was, you know, you'd take the club and stick the club into the belly button of the butt and then you'd have to take your grip and that would become the fulcrum, uh, the center of your stroke. And that was a drill. It was a drill a lot, you know, for a full swing. I remember David Ledbetter taught early on, you know, the club stays outside the hands and the club points in the center. Um, and then you go from there. But for, it makes so much sense to do it, you know, and, and you're seeing now the younger guys, Keegan Bradley, he's really made a mark, Webb Simpson, um, with a long putter. And boy, you know, if, if the USGA takes action and the PGA Tour follows, I mean, you're gonna have a lot of these top players struggle. Well, the interesting thing to me is that, you, you know, you talk about the effect on the Champions Tour and how a lot of players use it, you know, later in their, 
and later in their career. Webb Simpson's a guy who's used it his entire competitive career. Now, would that be fair to somebody like that who's learned the game? He basically learned the game with that long putter in his hand. No, it really wouldn't be fair. And I don't think anybody wants to see a guy like Webb Simpson go away. Um, uh, and I don't know why he would have started that way. What, what made him start is a big question. But, you know, I know the USDA is working with the definition. How do we, how do we come up with a way to word this so that it's uh, going to apply the way that we want to? You know, there's arguments that Billy Casper might have anchored his putter against. You know, he used his hands touching his left thigh when he putted. Um, is that anchoring? Is it the butt of the club that's anchoring? Um, if you have your thumb on top of the shaft, does it, it doesn't hit your chin, is that anchoring? That's why the rule book's only this thick, but the decision's book is this thick. Um, why, why do you think you're such a good player? What happens such a good player? That's a great question. Um, well, I can tell you a few things. You know, some people say, and this used to get me angry when, when a guy like Gary McCormick said, you're born a good putter. And you know, I think Haney talked about that in Tiger's book, that you know, you're not born a good putter, you're made into a good putter. But, you know, my dad was a good player, he was a good putter, still is. Um, I think it's a lot of how you grow up and where you grow up and what you learn. I, I grew up at the Allen Country Club, which is an old Donald Ross course with a lot of sloping greens. Um, I was a small kid when I first started playing, and these greens were tiny, so I missed greens. Uh, nothing's changed. But, um, I, you know, I missed greens a lot, and I don't ever remember playing, you know, where I had three footers that were inside the hole. Every putt had a lot of break to it. And I got used to doing that early on. Um, but, you know, my, my strokes evolved as I got to the I spent a lot of time with Scotty Cameron in the Scotty Cameron studio out there, which is one of my favorite places. Um, you know, my stroke used to go back a little bit too straight, cut across the ball a little bit. Um, but, you know, like, you can still pop well you know, stuff like that if you can repeat it. Um, but I spent a lot of time practicing, you know, and, and I don't know if I spent a lot of time practicing. If I do any teaching now with any of the players that I talk to, I think the mistake players make is they're always working on their stroke. They don't simply try and make enough putts, you know? Um, it's rare now to see a guy on the practice screen on the tour without some sort of device, or without a track, um, without a line, without a mirror videotape now, launch monitors for putting. Um, it's rare to see that. So a lot of times, you know, I'll try and get guys back in and trying to make putting more of a more of a game than more of a science. And equate it to other sports. You know, what did you get, you know, what did this player do? Did you play basketball? Did you play baseball? Did you, you know, throw a ball at a target? How did you do that? What did you think of? Um, and I, I really think, you know, somebody said that Mike Kevin asked me today, did you write a book on putting? I haven't. I've been in some stuff with Bob Rotel. I did a, a video with him years ago, but my book on putting the fundamentals of putting, if you guys could chime in here, but what is a fundamental, right? What is a fundamental? It's what most of the great players did. So now, if you talk about the basics, the fundamentals, grip, that would be a fundamental. Well, is it? I mean, how many guys grip the club the same? Very few. And I'm talking putting, I don't mind full shots, but it, nothing has changed more than the, the way players hold on to the putter now. Where you used to have, um, I can't hold that many. Um, yeah, I mean, I use a tr traditional reverse overlap grip. So nine fingers are on the shaft. Both my thumbs are down the center of the, of the club. My left index finger is the only thing off the, the club. But does that mean that's the right way to do it? You know, I know there's great players that have done that, and a lot of left hand low, like you said before. Um, and now with the belly player, there's infinite amount of grips. Uh, so what's a fundamental? Uh, where are you in your feet, your alignment? Is that a fundamental? I think. You know, there's kind of open stances, closed stances. So I have a hard time believing that's a fundamental. Some guys put their eyes over the ball, some guys are inside, some guys are upright, some guys are crouched over, some guys have the heel off the, the toe off the ground. Very few have the heel off the ground, paint Stuart or Stricker, right? Um, so what is a fundamental? Your shoulders have to be square. I don't think so. I mean, you might like that. You might just foot show, do your, does your head have to be still? I remember Ben Crenshaw. The first time I ever talked to Ben Crenshaw, I tell this to the players all the time, I can't believe it. Crenshaw in 1985 was playing at Disney World. And he was my favorite guy to watch. And 
He told me, uh, you remember the old announcer from England, Gary Smith, who worked for ABC? He wanted a video of Renshaw's stroke. We were down at Disney, there was nobody around in the floor on the Palm Hunting Ring. And uh, Gary had a video camera. Remember, he used to have the eight track video camera, it was bigger than the golf bag. So I said to Ben, and I, I was a second year tour player, I was nervous asking Ben if I could have my friend video his stroke. And Ben said, sure, come on up here. And nobody else was around. Ben just said to me, matter of fact, I'm not putting very well right now. I'm like, you? You know? So he, he dropped three balls on the ground. He goes, yeah, he says, um, I'm really not putting well. I'm, I'm not stroking through the ball. I'm, hit, I'm hitting at it or I'm stroking at the ball. It's kind of hard to figure out what that really means, you know? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. I said, well, what do you do when you're stroking at it and not stroking through it? He said, you know, I like to make my back stroke longer and let my head and knees move. Gary Smith dropped the camera. And I uh, looked at him and said, you let your head and knees move. And I said, he says, yeah. And he, just then John Houston walked on the putter. John Houston was a rookie and a great Bermuda grass putter from Florida. Tampa guy. And he was 30 feet away or so and didn't know we were watching him. So he dropped his three balls on the ground. And Ben says, just watch his knees. So we were looking at him. Houston, he putts. And you see a little bit of shift, a little bit of motion. And how many people putt here and try and stay still, right? Now try to try and lock yourself still so nothing moves. Like I think Nick Fowler lost a lot of his putting ability when he tried to keep his head down and never move it rather than let everything release. So I mean, and that builds tension to me. That builds tension. So go ahead and try sometime. Allow your lower body to move a little bit. Allow your head to swivel when you hit the putt. Follow the ball. Eyes on the ball, not head down. Eyes on the ball. Um, it makes a lot more sense to me. I think it really softens up your, um, your tension level. I like to feel like the backs of my arms are triceps and my arms are soft, you know. And, and one of the, the things that, that I do to check my amateur partners, uh, if you, let me try this so you stand up for a second. You know, just, you know, I just want to see you hold on to it for a second. Now, if you put your head with a hand. Now, hold on to it. <laughs> hold on to it. See, now, see he's holding on to it. Now, He's holding on to it so tight, so I can't move his arms. But now, keep holding on. Let your arms soften up. So now let me move your arms. So see how soft your arms are right there. Now hold on to it tight enough so that I can't twist the putter out of your hands, but still keep your arms soft. So now I'm not twisting the putter, but your arms are still soft. Now that's how I feel when I pop. But doesn't that finally, they, that everybody, one of the things I've heard a million times is that grip pressure. It just it right. seems to me that you need a really hard grip pressure to accomplish what you're talking about. Well, I don't think, I think your grip pressure is harder to hit the ball because there's compression and speed. But if you take the putter back to me, go ahead and see how my arms go, you not twist. So you can't twist out of hand, but my grip pressure is not that strong. Right. Maybe three out of 10 for a putter. But I like that softness and that feel. And I, you know, when you tight like that, I think trying to stay still builds too much tension a lot of times. I think back on something Jack Nicholas called me once that, uh, he said the best ball striker that he's ever seen in his life. I can imagine it's something that many people in this room might have heard is Lee Trevino. You know, who would teach somebody to swing the golf club like Lee Trevino? You know, or Arnold Palmer. So, I mean, there are a million different ways to accomplish what you want to do. How do you, uh, everything, does, does everything necessitate kind of an individual? Absolutely. And you know, Dave Stockton's gained a lot of popularity the last few years teaching, you know, Phil and a few his other players, method. and it's his method, right. which has worked very well for Dave, and I applaud him for doing it, I think it's great. And, uh, you know, I remember playing with Dave and Tom Kite, because Tom would, Tom would ask, you know, bell cap for us, and, you know, but um, Tom, I have to, um, but, you know, I remember Stockton always liked the ball to go in softly, you know, he said, I like to see the ball go in softly, you know, when I put it my best, if I missed the hole, I always had to mark the ball because it went too far by to tap it in. Right. And which is what Tiger was doing when he was playing his best. When he was playing with Tom Watson, too, he right. played his best. Now, Crenshaw would have been the opposite. So what's right? You know, Dave Pelz's um, research showed 17 inches past the hole was the best speed to hit a putt. And I always kid him and said, you know, every putt I get 17 inches by the hole missed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> So, you know, I, pra I practice trying to hit the ball at different speeds. That's one of the, the games I give guys to do is, can you hit a putt in and hit it in as, as 
much brake and pitch it in soft you can engage the hole in the so that it jumps off the back of the hole. Because really, the, the, the right speed to the ball is the, the speed that goes with the line you're hitting. Do you think you can teach someone to be a good putter? Absolutely. Absolutely. The reason I say that, that's a great question, but that's, that's where I'm, I'm most proud of. My putting has been good for a long time, but it got better as I got into my 30s. And so all these people that say, oh, you're just lucky to be born a good putter, go away with it. My stats got better into the 90s and the late 90s, and even in the early 2000s. I, I, I think I was the staff in 2000 a couple of times. Because, um, you know, I worked on my stroke. I changed some stuff over time. Um, but you can get better. And it should be the easiest part of your game because it requires the least amount of physical skill, doesn't it? I mean, you don't have to be a great athlete to be a good putter. You don't have to be unbelievably strong or flexible. And you can putt with any kind of putter you can right now. So it should be something that everybody should, should be good at. And it has to be combination of the right equipment for sure. I see a lot of people out there with horrible equipment, but you know, combination of good mechanics and a great mind, you know, it's all to say that, you know, the thing that's the most important, you, you could have the best putters in the world, you could have the best stroke in the world, but if you have a good mind, your confidence, you're never going to be great. That brings up a good point. When you are playing your most successful, or when you are playing your most successful, how much does, uh, and this is kind of a rhetorical question, how much does confidence mean to you? How much does it affect your game? I mean, it obviously affects anybody. But. Sure. You know, everybody that's played the game, I know everybody in here has. Um, if you think about your best rounds, your best shots, your best putting rounds, um, those days were always easy. The club that you had to hit, when you get the yardage and the club's already coming out of the bag before you think nine, you know, it's 135 yards. Um, and it's a little draw, or, or this is going to be a little fake. You, you know that so, so, somehow up there in that brain, or as the subconscious brain works, um, things are easy. And, um, you know, you've all had that feeling. I'm sure you've had the feeling, I know I'm going to hit this shot well before I hit it. I know I'm going to make this putt before I putt it, right? Occasionally, right? Occasionally. So if you could get your mind that way more often, no matter what your level is, right, you're going to be a better player. So, well, I think that applies to anything in life, though. If you don't absolutely. think you can do something, then you probably can. Right. If you think you can, then at least you've got a chance. That's right. And, you know, we've all learned more about the golf sports. We've got more, you, know, you as an announcer, me as a player, and everybody here as a player and a teacher. Um, but does that necessarily make you more confident off the tee? Wouldn't you like to throw away all those thoughts for a day when you go out to play? And sometimes you have to. But, there's still a lot of great players that have them. swing keys when they're playing, swing thoughts when they're playing. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's always that you know, kind of seesaw going back and forth between kind of too many thoughts and not enough. Let me take a little bit of a left turn here because I know there are, yeah, obviously everybody in this game, the majority of people in this room play this game at a, at a pretty high level. But there are some who, who play competitively a lot and aspire to play competitively more. If you were to give somebody one piece of advice, what's the most valuable thing that somebody taught you when you were a young golfer, when you were just starting on your journey to play competitively? Did somebody give you something that, you know, that you can recall? Or? You know, I, I was given not literally the keys, but the ability to go play. You know, I, I, I caddied for my, I was a caddy the kid, caddy for my dad off. And I would get to go play in the afternoons all the time as a kid. And I, I love to go out and play. And I, um, I could play around the clock and just keep going. And I'd always try different shots, try to ball in different ways, high, low, left, right. Um, and a lot of times, if I was lucky enough to, of course, with empty, I'd play three balls. And I'd beat Tom Watson, I'd beat Jack Nichols, and I'd beat me and try to beat those guys. Um, so my advice is to keep, you've got to learn to get the ball in the hole. You've got to learn to score. And I don't know how you do that just on the drive range. You've you know, you got to find a way to get out there and play. And I, I would say as a teacher, you've got to find uh, what's the difference between your students on the drive range and on the golf course. And I know it's hard to do that. And a lot of times we don't have that set up. But uh, the little teaching I've done to tour players in the putting green, boy, the, the reactions to the way players have after they miss a shot versus after they hit a good shot, that's a big 
part of teaching. And if you don't know how they react, I don't think you would teach them well. What do you think makes for a good teacher? Well, it's a combination of everything. I've seen a lot of good teachers that, uh, you know, some of them played a lot in their career, some of them didn't play that much, some of them were, you know, very studious where they know everything about the swing. Um, others are more in that, you know, right side brain where you just go out and, and play. Um, but it, it's, it's a personality mix with your student. You have to kind of get to know um, your student. I, I remember the Titus had an educational workshop at the PGA show this year. Jay Haas had the Harmons up there. And Jay's opening line was, I always like working with um, Harmons because they don't teach golf so they teach people. I thought that was a remarkable statement, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of teachers that know maybe technically what you're supposed to do every single click of the golf swing, but if you can't you know, relate that in, in a way where you can bring it to the golf course, it doesn't do anybody any good. You don't have to tell any tales out of school, but if you had to kind of throw a rope around the, the usual suspects out on the tour, who, who do you think is considered the preeminent teacher out there? Well, it has to be Butch still, you know, because he's got so many of the top players. Um, and, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that they, the top players when they're struggling in their game go to Bush because he's got that reputation of, you know, having taught Tiger then, you know, Adam Scott came over there, he taught him long before Tiger, and he's been around a long time. Um, you know, he's still got guys that have good looking swings like Nick Watney, you know, you like to watch that guy hit a golf ball. Um, and, and then you got the more of the technician guys. I know um, Sean Foley, maybe he spoke here last year, two years ago. Um, had a lot of success. It's had a lot of success. Between Tiger and Justin Rose and Hunter Mayhem twice. And guys with great looking swings. And I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with my Ben and Andy Plummer. And, and I know they, they're very technical with what they teach. I like a lot of what they say. And I learned a lot about what the different teachers say when I was working for NBC with you a couple of years ago. You know, because they want to get their name on TV with <coughs> players too. Um, yeah. But, you know, you, you, you can kind of. I could get a feel for whether this player, whether the teacher kind of knew what they were talking about, whether they were guessing or whether they were just kind of going along for the ride. And a lot of it's, you know, making sure your player is more confident when he walks on the first tee. And you don't have to tell them a lot of stuff to do that sometimes. Let's, uh, let's circle back to NBC for a second because he always seems to be a flashpoint. But uh, what do you think about John Miller as a player? Not as a colleague, but if you were a player, how would you feel? about a guy who's as candid as he is and you think he's been fair? God, I know he'd love to be here to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he certainly <laughs> have an opinion. That's it, right? As a player, I mean, you know, he was a guy when I first started really watching golf and television, which had been early to mid-70s, where I was really paying attention. You know, he was dressing like people dress now, white belts and black pants. And, uh, and he, by the way, would tell you that he was the one who was responsible for the fashion show. Too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe the best iron player that we've ever seen. Uh, his caddy, Andy Martinez, who's now caddy for Tom Landon, used to give him yardages of half yards, 142 and a half. And he's serious about it. Uh, but, you know, again, a guy that had some different looking stuff to his golf swing, uh, changed a little bit, his body type changed a little bit, but he was an amazing guy to watch hit a golf ball. But what about the whole idea? Because he, he is a flashpoint out on tour. <laughs> He's very candid. I, I mean, I can tell you from having known Johnny for a long time and having worked with him that there's not a malicious bone in his body. And that's, I, I, I don't know what your feeling is, right. but he's he's just incapable of not saying what's in his brain. <laughs> and, you know, that gets a lot of us in trouble when we do stuff like that. But I mean, it's the perfect position for a uh, you know, for a television commentator in golf, but I mean, you can be abrasive, it can love a lot of people the wrong way. I mean, how do you think, how do you think most of the golfers feel about it? I think they feel that he's abrasive a lot of the times, but I think if they came up to confront him with it and had a candid conversation, they'd come away with, you know, maybe he is right, maybe I was joking, or maybe I, I didn't do the right thing there, but, you know, he, he has some good insight. I think he's got, uh, you know, a lot of experience here. And if I can bore you one story, but when I first started working with you at NBC, and you were a big help to me because I talk too fast all the time. You know, but, uh, you told me to breathe. But at Doral, the World Golf Championships in 2010, uh, if you remember, Ernie Els was 
close to the league with Charles Schwartz that was playing yeah. and staying at his house. So it was a great story to play together. And um, as the tournament started on Sunday, uh, but I was covering the, say the 13th, 14th, 5th, 7th, 13th, 5th, 9th, 13th, and 14th holes, and I was just paying attention to my monitors like I'm supposed to in my tower. But on the third hole, Ernie Els had a second shot into the green. I don't know if you remember this, I remember like it was yesterday. And that hole has water to the right. There's a bank sloping from the left, from the right edge of the green into the water. The pin was on the right, the wind was blowing left to right. And Els was hit this eight iron from the middle of the ferrule. And I was just watching the live TV that everybody else would see at home. And Johnny's, this is Johnny's old Johnny's coach. Here you can see Ernie lining up. You can see he's aiming, and there's a little pause. He goes, eight feet left of the side. <laughs> and he, goes, he said, eight feet left of the side. I looked at eight feet. And I'm looking at, how would you know that? There's a shot link tower behind the green. And that was like 30 feet left of the flag. And that's right where I thought he was aiming. And the ball went right at it. And Johnny said, well, you know, we got safe and pulled it a little bit. And I went, right. And so I just stored that in my ask Johnny later. Um, so after the, um, after the tournament's over and we're in the trailer, um, there's some couches in there. Of course, Roger was sprawled on the couch. Um, and uh, Johnny walks in and everybody's you know, happy because the tournament's over and there's a buzz. And I said, Johnny, i got to ask you a question. Now, this is first week of job for me. You know, I, don't, I didn't see John. He doesn't show up till Friday, so I, I was working Thursday. I got there on Tuesday thinking that was a smart move. Um, so I said, John, on the third hole, Ernie Hells is hitting the second shot. And you said he's aiming eight feet left. I said, where did you get eight feet? Do you know what he said to me? I do. He said, I can see it in his eyes where they're looking. <laughs> Roger, I can't show you what Roger did in the background. <laughs> All in his eyes, I go, you can see it in his eyes, and he believes that. <laughs> he, he kind of put me down. He says, you'll figure it out in another 30 years. <laughs> uh, he's uh, unlike many people in the game. Tradition like in uh, that, that too. Uh, what about Q School and the new schedule? Boy, what do you think about that? You're a former policy uh, worker. Right. Uh, I hate it, by the way. I, hate I, I would use the H word there too. Uh, the Q School is going to be have a major change after 2012. This is the last year, if you guys want to get on the PGA Tour that you can go through the Q School and get directly onto the PGA Tour uh, for some reason. And, and I said this when I was on the board and the staff, the team staff first came out and said, this is our new idea to spruce up the Q School and, and the nation. Was this life. real? This was, they were floating this idea that long ago? Oh yeah, this took a long time to get here, but Nationwide had told the tour they were unhappy with their sponsorship. They still have remaining years left to their, fulfill their contract. But they wanted an out. And uh, I told Andy Panzer, who, who was one of the top guys there, I said, Andy, if this was a great idea, you would have proposed this to Nationwide while they were still there. But this is an idea for you to sell a sponsorship. And I think it's wrong. And I said, one of the things that draws people to golf is the ability for the underdog to win, the ability for everybody to start off each week at even, tied. And now, Peter Uline, unless he gets enough sponsor exemption, makes enough money in five events or a few more than that. He has like $600,000 to get his, his card so he doesn't have to go for a full year onto the nationwide tour. So anybody now is going to have to go play off the PGA Tour. You know, if, if we had a Tiger Woods-like guy that got that hype prior to getting out of here, that's a big letdown having to see that guy go somewhere else. Well, there was a fellow last year, a really good young player from Alabama, who made it onto tour by, you know, one of only six people who's ever done it, but called by taking his sponsor's exemptions and then earning enough money during those, I guess it's six sponsor's exemptions right. to get on tour. What, what I don't like about it is that uh, I think Q School is one of the great events in golf. I mean, it's just, aside from the opportunities it presents, and just as a sports fan, it presents something that's really unlike anything else. The other thing I don't like about what they've done is, and this, you talk about the commercial aspect of it, this was really done to satisfy FedEx. Because FedEx was unhappy that all the fall events were kind of an afterthought and people flooded, you know, they were going to Europe or wherever else in the world to get a paycheck. 
make a bunch of money, and then they were having to compete against their own product. So now all of these events in the fall will be FedEx Cup events, whether they'll be fully. Uh, so the point the beginning of the year is going to start. And that's the problem. Yes. So it's like it's going to become like tennis. And tennis is a great sport, but tennis has kind of shot itself in the foot, I think, publicly in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is that nobody knows when the season starts, when when it ends, where it is. Right. Well, the Europeans were jumping on us, and they started to go to Asia first and outside of Europe much quicker than us. And then they, they got those events that the, what we would call the end of the year, right. you know, sponsored and, you know, real persons. The guys are playing those now. So the, what off-season we have is going to be gone. Yeah, and there's another problem with the way that this is currently constructed. It's, you know, they're going to tweak this thing. But one of the biggest problems for, for me, again, to, to watch is that, so what they're, what they're proposing currently is that the top 75 players on the nationwide tour are going to be put into a field with numbers one or 126 through 200 right. for the PGA Tour, and then there's going to be this three-event series. So now, if you're number 10 on the Nationwide Tour, you've spent an entire year, and you're the 10th best player on the Tour, they're telling you that that means the same as being the 75th best player on the Tour. It doesn't really count for anything other than the money. You're in the same position that that player would be. And that basically devalues a, a year of work, aside from, you know, the, you know, the money that you earn, it's the opportunity. You know, you've earned nothing. You know, it doesn't make sense. And, you know, I would think these tournaments are going to be title sponsored by somebody. Mm -hmm. And if, say, number 30 on the DJ Tour money list wants to go play in that tournament, they have to shut down the top 125 guys from playing in their event. With, it's a different mindset. You're going to have to get used to this. And the, one of the tour's arguments that it works is the success the nationwide tour players have had versus the Q school players. You know, they have more experience, they play a full year, they travel. Um, and it's true, the numbers, you know, will show that more of the better players have come out of the nationwide tour. Uh, Carl, I don't know where you are, but uh, why don't we open it up to questions from everybody out there. I'm sure that there are a lot of people who'd like to ask Brad uh, his thoughts on anything we've talked about. Who are you? Who are you? Senior tour, and you guys went through the Q school. But with the depth of players coming up through the ranks right now, I wanted to know what your thoughts were on potential expansion of the tour, um, maybe dollars versus points um, in evaluating players' histories, and where you think the future of the senior tour is. Well, thanks, Charlie. Um, Charlie and I actually grew up playing a lot of golf together, and Charlie caddy for me in the 1981 U.S. Open at um, which was, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you're that old? Yeah. Um, well, Charlie, I turned 50 last August, uh, and was lucky enough to have made enough money and had enough wins to get straight out and exempt onto the Champions Tour. And, you know, there's been a, an evolution in the Champions Tour, as we've seen, uh, when, it first started out with just a few events that were just the bigger name players, and the tour grew to, I think, at a peak 39 events. The Champions Tour when Dana Creek set that record for most events played um, in a row that'll never, that's the, you know, Cal Ripken record that'll never be broken. There's just simply not enough events left. There's 23 or 4 now. Um, I played with Gil Morgan last year at Westchester, and uh, when they announced Gil Morgan, the first team, they said, you know, winner of five PGA Tour events and then blank Champions Tour events. He's had 27 <laughs> wins in the Champions Tour. You know, Taylor won a 47. Um, Bruce Fleischer, 19. You know, a lot of guys who really wouldn't have thought of won so many times. And uh, I think the, wrong, the right number, Charlie, would be somewhere in the high 20s, you know, 26, 27, 28. 
um, where you know it's, a, it's an 81 man field that's bounced back and forth between 78 players. Um, they're trying to get more access to the Monday qualifying, uh, so there's seven spots, sometimes six spots. But it's hard to get out there. I mean, you have to have played well on the PGA Tour, and then if you, if you get lucky enough to get your Q, your card through the Q School, you have to finish in the top 31 um, on the money list. And it's confusing to me because there's a money list and then there's a points list. The Schwab Cup list is only on top 10 finishes, so you can finish 11th all year, probably finish 10th or 15th on the money list, and then miss the Schwab Cup final. So the, the point thing is a little bit high. Um, as far as the competition goes, um, you know, obviously the depth of field isn't as great on the Champions Tour, but the, the courses that we've played, you know, the guys that have been out there a long time, Tom Kite, they, they think their courses are longer than the DJ Tour, they think the roughs are and the greens are harder and faster. Um, I haven't found that to be the case at all. But I, I mean, I've, I've been surprised that the length of the course has been pretty long. All the courses we've played are very close to 7,000, 7,100. We've had a 7,200 yard course. But the, the winning scores are low. You know, I think some of the players, when they get it going, they still shoot low scores, you know. Uh, and What's the sense? Freddie and Cal. You know, very good, difficult, pinball locations, you know. They, um, they'll, they'll move the tees around on a couple holes, but they make some of the par threes easier and some of the a par four drivable here and there. Um, but you know, Charlie, some of the players that played well years ago that didn't win the big money um, didn't get that exempt status right away. There's some guys that were younger players who made money later in their career. So that's a battle to try and figure out what's, what's more priority, wins or money. But um, it's been very fun. I always tell people it's kind of like hitting uh, XM Radio, the 80, XM Radio, the 80s channel, because you're seeing Sticks, Foreigner, you know, Journey. <laughs> Seeing how long it's been, there's Charlie Ball. I played with him 50 years ago, uh, but it's been it's been a, it's been a blast. Much more relaxed, you know. Difference of three turns, uh, three rounds versus four. You know, that's a different mindset, and I, I think that the mindset with that no cut in three rounds. Guys are aggressive from the first tee on. You know, it's the attitude. I'm just going to fire the flag. You know, um, I don't I don't think many guys are carrying one iron to hit it off the tee. Joe still does. Joe still does.